From Square Two, this is What's Wrong With Revenue. I'm Mike Lieberman, CEO at Square Two, and along with my longtime friend, Eric Kalis, and co-founder at Square Two and six-time entrepreneur, Eric and I will answer the question CEOs have every single day, what's wrong with revenue? You can be part of the live cast show where we'll answer your questions every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, or catch the show on demand on YouTube and on all your favorite podcast networks. Also check out all our audio and video content on Square2 Plus at the square2marketing.com website. Enjoy the show. Hey everybody, welcome to What's Wrong With Revenue, episode 26. I'm Mike Lieberman from Square Two and I'm joined by my longtime friend and business partner, Eric Kalis. Eric, say hi to everybody. Hello. Sorry for the delay, we're having some technical issues. Eric is out and about in Detroit and what can I say, the hotel Wi-Fi is not our best, but we're gonna power through. He's got his hotspot activated. I think we're gonna be good. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, Remember, you can check out What's Wrong With Revenue at, on YouTube at the Square Two Marketing Channel and on our own website, bottom of the link, bottom of the footer, what's wrong with revenue and our brand new streaming service, square to marketing.com backslash square two plus. All of our audio and video content is available there. And if you're into uh, podcasts, the live cast gets converted into a podcast and is posted every Thursday morning. You can check us out on all your favorite podcast platforms. Today, we're going to talk about the big issue with revenue, your tech stack could be messed up. We see it pretty frequently. Um, and in a lot of cases, the people we're talking to bought technology because they thought it would solve a problem. Uh, but you may not know this, it's proven. Technology rarely solves problems. It's really more about process and people. The technology is actually a tool. And we tell this to our prospects a lot. If you're going to build a house, you need a hammer, but just giving you a hammer doesn't mean you know how to build a house. You literally have to have the skills required to build the house. The hammer just helps you do it in a much more efficient way. So sometimes the technology works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and you really need to make sure that it's designed properly, that someone's paying attention to it, uh, and that you can really leverage it to drive your business. So uh, some of you may know if you watch the show frequently, we like to plant Easter eggs, so stay tuned. We got an Easter egg for you guys. We'll uh, share with you with that at the end of the show. Um, but today, I'm going to try to cover a couple of things. I want to help everybody know how to evaluate your current tech stack and make sure that it's doing what you expect it to. I also want to help you know how to uh, engage with that tech stack so it delivers on its value proposition. And then who in the company should be responsible for it? How do you keep track of it and make sure it's running smoothly? Um, how do you prevent a messy tech stack from happening again? Like if you fix it once, you don't want to have to fix it again in a year. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then maybe how you wrap a system of support around the technology. So it is always a helpful tool that helps you grow. And like always, we have a good collection of questions from people who watch and listen to the show. And we'll handle questions today as well. And with that, Eric, I love when you make opening comments. What do you have to say about this idea of a messy tech stack? Well, happen to have some thoughts on this issue, Mike. The first thing is that a lot of people, like you said earlier, think that technology is the silver bullet, and it's really not. And, you know, we're a HubSpot agency. Even though we fancy ourselves as brand agnostic, we really just lean into HubSpot, Salesforce uh, as a combo sometimes. But what happens is, is that people want to start the conversation around technology. And when I'm talking to prospective clients, I often say to them, hey, technology is only 10% of the issue here. 90% of it is your marketing strategy and how you can execute. The software just makes it easy. It's a great platform. It collects data for us to make better decisions, but it's not the end all. And they get a little taken aback because they think, well, I heard about this HubSpot thing. I'll just stick it in there and everything will be great. But like anything else, it has to be thought out. It has to be planned. It has to be mapped to business processes. It has to have buy-in from the team. And then you have to have the ongoing optimization of what you're doing. 
I think a lot of people just think it's a set it and forget it like QuickBooks would be, right? I set up QuickBooks. I know how to put a check in the bank. I know how to write a check. I know how to uh, look at my inventory levels and that's it. But that's not what marketing automation is about. Um, marketing automation is uh, making everything orchestrated, making everything um, data relative so that you can understand, well, how is my CRM interacting with the hub, which is also working with my webstone, which is, website, which is the keystone of the entire marketing program, bring it all together to get those insights to get more results. So since the title of the show is What's Wrong with Revenue, I think a lot of people put the wrong or um, Un, uh, uh, misweighted uh, uh, weight on technology when they should be thinking about strategy first. I think that's a really good point. And I also think some of what's contributing that is, look, we talk about HubSpot, but there's Salesforce and there's Adobe and there's Pardot and there's Drift and there's all uh, Keep and, you know, uh, Zoho. There's so many technology products, I think, if you guys are interested in like a little bit of a distraction, if you Google Scott Brinker's marketing technology landscape, he has this amazingly cluttered picture. I think I've shown it in a previous episode of the Mark tech and sales tech uh, community. And there's like 8,000 companies in that space. So, so like we talk about a few here on the show, but it's really amazing that how many products there are out there and how many companies are being told by these uh, software companies, buy our product, everything's going to be great. You're going to hit your revenue goals. You know, your company's going to shoot up to the top, hockey stick growth. And again, it, 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 it doesn't work like that. Their, their objective is to sell you software. So they're obviously going to say, this is what you need to grow. But there's much more associated with uh, turning that software into growth for businesses. And you, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but I think the biggest piece of it is and we've mentioned it before on the show, you're, you're, what you're trying to do to grow a company's revenue is create this amazing experience for your prospects and your customers. And that starts when they hear a story about your company from somebody, and then they go to your website and they have an amazing experience and they learn a little bit more about what you do. And maybe you, you, you have an opportunity to share some educational material with them and they're, they're on a journey and that educational material is helpful to them. So they, they, they digest it and they appreciate it. Maybe they come back again and they, they read something else. Or maybe they, if you're doing this well, you encourage them to subscribe to your blog or your email newsletter, or in our case, you know, like our, our st streaming service for content. So, you know, I trust this company enough to become uh, connected to them in some way. I'm letting them into my world. And then those communications are really smart and, and educational and Eventually, there became, their uh, uh, pain becomes acute enough for them to want to talk to someone in sales, and that experience continues to be constructive and educational, and, and, and you start to trust them as a business, and you trust your salesperson to the point where you, you, you're really evaluating the services that they provide or the products that they're selling, and they, yes, this is going to fit my needs, I'm, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to become a customer. And after that transaction happens, the experience continues and they do have a great experience with you as a customer and they buy more and they become an advocate for your business. So if that's the end game here, and it is, you need a platform to deliver that. All of those things I talked about, how hard would that be to deliver those things without some kind of software product product or products, right? How, how hard would it be to not have some of that process automated, I, I venture to say it would be impossible to really create that amazing experience without some software as an underpinning of that. But this is not about whether you need the software or not. You, you need the software. We admit that. Pretty quickly, that software can get uh, messed up, right? You, you have lots of people in it. You have lots of different people with different ideas about what the software should do. Uh, you, you, it covers so many areas of your business that there's a lot of opportunities for normal business changes that go on in the company to impact that software and how it's set up and how it's running. Um, there are just a lot of places for it to get confused, dirty, uh, uh, in some cases, like not, not working properly. Uh, you know, uh, if, if you're input, Im importing lists into the system, like that can become cumbersome. And it's not as if 
a messy tech stack is going to prevent your website from working or your emails from functioning properly, but it is going to impact your ability or, or your team's ability to execute efficiently. If there are things all over the place and it takes you, you know, a half an hour to find something that should take you 30 seconds, obviously that's an efficiency issue. If there are notifications that have been set up, but, but because of some reason that notification isn't emailing the right person anymore, you literally could be generating leads and not have anyone know, know that that lead has been generated nor follow up on it. So there are a lot of places where um, uh, portals that have become uh, confusing or messy can absolutely contribute to less than expected results and, and potentially be holding back your company from a growth perspective. So I think that's the context for our conversation today. So I want to talk a little bit about how you might know if your tech stack needs this kind of attention or not. Like what would be some of the signals that might uh, trigger you to wonder and to look around a little bit, or maybe even have someone take a look at your portals and say like, yeah, this actually is an issue. And I got a couple that I'll kind of get the conversation going, Eric. And then if you want to add on to that, feel free. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. So. Um, I actually have this because we're working on some content at Square Two. So this is very timely for the conversation we're having today. So if you've had some turnover in marketing, meaning maybe you're new to the role, you know, you've been here a couple months and the person that was there before you was only there for six months or maybe a year or so, or maybe someone bought HubSpot or bought Salesforce or bought Drift, um, you know, three or four years ago. And in that time, not much has been done with it because there's been turnover in marketing or maybe marketing priorities have, have been in other places. Or if you've had uh, a number of agencies helping you, which means they've been in and out of your portal too. It's very likely that that could have potentially caused the portal to get a little messed up, right? There, there, there tends to be a lack of a handoff when people switch agencies. There's definitely a lack of a handoff when people leave organizations and new people come in. Uh, people have different ways of doing things. They, they use different naming conventions. Uh, there are, a, a, if, if that sounds like your company, it could be an indication that there are some um, potential issues that would need to be looked at. Another one is if you've changed your technology strategy, meaning, you know, we've been using HubSpot for marketing, but we went from Zoho to Salesforce. Or, you know, we've been using Salesforce on HubSpot, but we started using Gong to record calls, or we started using, out, using Outreach IO, or we've been downloading lists from Seamless AI or Zoom Info. Like, if there's been a technology change, or you've added additional technology tools, or you've swapped out technology tools, that could also be an indication that it, it might be a good opportunity to take a look at your technology and make sure it's working right. Um, again, there's a lot of integrations that go into those technology couplings. Integrations do not last forever. You know, I know HubSpot has some tools to help with integration. Those are relatively new. If you've been using a middleware tool like Zapier or some other middleware tools, they, they need some care and feeding. So just because something was set up um, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't in any way uh, just assume that it's still working. I think it makes sense to have somebody look at it and make sure that data is still moving back and forth, because if it's not, some of the data you're looking at might not be accurate. Some of the decisions you're making might be using uh, inaccurate data. And that is definitely something you probably don't wanna do for too long. Um, Eric, anything you wanna add? Yeah, I think also that there's two other issues that would be like the uh, flashing red lights. Uh, performance, right? Hey, all of a sudden I'm not getting the amount of leads that I get. Well, what's wrong? Well, maybe there's some kind of notification or some kind of conversion form that's broken. So lots of times I sit to myself, oh, something's not right here. I don't feel the regular rhythm of what used to happen or an ongoing. So that's number one. And number two is you're downright, your metrics are, are heading down, right? Like, wait, what's wrong with this? I don't understand. A good example would be we had some challenges with some of the pages that we wanted to search engine optimize for square two. All of a sudden we were like, why are these metrics going down? And we realized algorithms had changed. We didn't give it the care and feeding, as you said. And now our uh, performance reports were indicating that technology wasn't performing in some way. So just two other things that are red flags when it comes to looking at what's going on with your systems. 
Awesome points. Um, you know, you can also go back to the software companies and most of them are pretty good at taking a look at your, the way you set up your products, the way you're using your products, and they can probably give you some guidance as well. Now they're not going to do anything for you because it's yours and you own it, but they might be able to kind of point you in the right direction. And if you have some time on your hands, you could probably go in and make some of the changes or updates that they're suggesting. And these products, you know, there's, you know, SaaS is great. Like when back in the day, when I bought software, it was premise based. Like you had disks that came to your office and you loaded them in the computer today. Everything is SaaS based, which is really fantastic. But these companies are changing their product every week. I mean, HubSpot literally puts out a new version of its product on a weekly basis. Um, we actually publish a, a an email that you can subscribe to that that shares all these updates with you so you can stay on top of it. But it's a massive amount of updates. And sometimes those updates change the way you had the product con configured and you might need to make an adjustment. Um, you may want to take advantage of those new updates in a different way than you're using the, the older version. So there's a lot of opportunities to, to try to stay current on what these tools do now versus what they did when you first bought it. Um, Mike, was that the Easter egg right there? No, so that is not that is not the Easter egg. That's just uh, an extra little token of our appreciation for people who listen to the show. Yeah, if you want to, there's a page on our website called HubSpot Services. If you go to that page, you can uh, find a little button that says subscribe to HubSpot product updates. We send those out once a month. So um, if you're interested in that, that is not the Easter egg. You have to listen to the end of the show to get the Easter egg. Um, okay. So um, let's see, like, uh, Eric, what if I need a little help? With this right i'm on my own and you know i've noticed some of the things you guys are talking about um what wh where do i go i mean i did mention this the the software companies themselves but they're not really going to do anything for you where, where might i be able to turn if i do think i have a messy uh tech stack and i want to try to clean it up yeah so actually you know if you go to those software companies that you use right they all have partner pages or uh, service provider pages that you can access. So you go to HubSpot, you got a HubSpot product, you go to the agency pages, you pick an agency, right? That's kind of straightforward. The agencies themselves are really critical. I remember um, a colleague of mine was uh, having trouble with Salesforce, brought in a Salesforce consulting agency. They fixed them all up. It was a matter of 60 days or so and they're back on their way. So no matter what the technology, there's typically an agency that's going to support that. But in the great, great resignation that's going on right now in 2022, there's a lot of these folks that are super schooled in some of these softwares that are available on a contract basis. And smaller companies or people that need patches or needs, contract are also a good source. You know, to contract with a contractor for 5000 to fix up your bowl of spaghetti that uh, your portal looks like uh, is a quick fix and a very direct uh, application to what can be done. Yeah, that's really good advice. And I think the other thing everyone should keep in mind is you want to try to prevent this from happening again. So, you know, one of the bullets that we identified for this show that we want to talk about is how do you keep this from happening again? And I think this is a really interesting point that we can talk about for a couple of minutes, then we can dive into questions because the questions we have this week are really good. But while you're there, there's, there's two ways to make sure this doesn't happen. A, you should apply some best practices out of the gate. Now, in this scenario that we've been talking about today, you guys all have tech stacks and they're messed up, right? But if you are for some reason starting fresh and you could potentially scrap the whole thing and start over again, we've had people ask us if they should do that. It's generally not our guidance, but it, sometimes it seems like that's the best approach because it's so messed up. But you want to start to document what you're doing. And if you do get someone to clean it up, make sure part of that process is to document some best practices, right? What are my naming conventions going to be? Where do I put things? Um, what is my process around using the, the, uh, the tool for a variety of things? Like if it comes to creating a new landing page, okay, like how do I create a new landing page at company A? Here are the best practices. Where do I put the new landing page, right? What assets need to wrap, be wrapped around the landing page, like a form? And where do I put forms? What do I name that form? How do I associate that form to the landing page? Um, what forms are good for what tasks? Some for shorter forms are good for early stage buyer journey uh, content. Some longer forms are, are really perfect for late stage buyer journey um, uh, content. So how do you document that so that everyone in the company can understand how to use the technology in the same way? So if you are going to hire someone as Eric's recommending, 
I think a big part of that exercise should be to help them create some documentation for you so this never happens again. And the other piece of that is, and this is guidance we give a lot of uh, clients and prospects, is someone really has to own it. You know, this is very common. It actually happens at the agency a lot. You know, we all know how to use HubSpot. So everybody is in HubSpot and, you know, everyone has a slightly different way of doing things. And that is a symptom to, to definitely mess up your portal. So, you know, it, it would be great if one person could own it. That focuses the attention and it's easier for one person to follow a set of best practices. If you're going to have a couple of people or a lot of people in it, make sure you have the documentation so that everyone's following the same playbook and when they set something up, they all set it up the same way. So I think that would be good advice for anyone who's, who's tackling a project like this. And you want to make sure you don't get in the same situation again. So uh, let's do some questions. So I got a good question here. This is from, hold on, let me make it a little bit bigger. This is from, okay, John in Chicago. We have a CRM, so I think we're good there. But our marketing tech sec is a collection of one-off solutions, email, social, SEO. Should we be considering pulling those together on one platform? So, Eric, I know you have an opinion about this. The difference between the uh, point solutions versus the one platform, what do you think John should consider here? I mean, you know, it's hard to separate our fanaticism for HubSpot with advice. People think, oh, you're selling HubSpot. We're really not. The tool is an all-in-one platform that could literally eliminate all the disparate technologies that a lot of people use. And that scenario that you described, Mike, I got constant contact over here and I got the Hootsuite over here is so common. For the amount of effort that it takes, which of course there's time related to that, which is time equals money, and the efficiencies that come with orchestrating all of these activities on one platform, HubSpot's a no-brainer. I mean, I don't understand why people want to go through the pain of logging in a constant contact, importing this list. Then when they convert, they go over to this spreadsheet. Then I have to put them in the Salesforce. For goodness sakes, buy the one platform, get it all set up the correct way and go. I don't think there's any need for any of those point solutions anymore. Yeah, that's, I would probably say something similar. In, in, in my experience, it, it's kind of like a graduation exercise. I think when companies start getting serious about marketing, uh, it, it kind of grows organically. Like we want to do some email marketing, get me an email. Let's get an email marketing platform. Okay. Check. Email marketing is running. Okay, good. Uh, you know, I want to, uh, I, I think we should do more with SEO. Let, let's get an SEO uh, tool to help us do some keyword research and see what our competitors are doing and see how we're doing from a ranking perspective. Okay. I signed up for SEM rush. Oh, by the way, you know, I want to publish more aggressively on social media and we need a platform to help us manage all that test because hopping from Facebook to Twitter to LinkedIn, it's, it's a nightmare. So, okay, uh, 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 Spr uh, Sprout Social or Hootsuite, as Eric mentioned, like those are good uh, individual social media tools. And then before you know it, you have four or five individual products. You've been using them for a year or two. And you're like, okay, this is good, but I'm hopping around from platform to platform. I don't have any data that's consistent across the platforms. I feel like maybe this isn't the most efficient use of my time. The company's grown a little bit. We've gotten a little more sophisticated around marketing. And I think at that point, if that's how it feels like at your company, you should start to consider a more sophisticated product. And whether it's HubSpot or the, the, the uh, Salesforce cloud or uh, Adobe's product or Zoho, like, I don't think it really matters, but looking at one of those more all-inclusive products is going to allow you to graduate to the next level. You're going to be more efficient. There are things that you want to do now that you can't do on those point solutions that you will be able to do uh, more effectively on, on one of those platform products. And I think you'll find that that step up is, is appropriate for where you and the company is from a sophistication perspective. So I think it generally comes down to how sophisticated is the organization. And then what's nice is most of those products allow you to continue to, to get even more sophisticated. So, you know, if you start with HubSpot's basic product suite, you can do some, some, some things there. And as you start to want to do more, you may graduate to the uh, pro level HubSpot suite across sales marketing and service and be able to do more. And then as the company gets bigger and more sophisticated, you can graduate to the enterprise suite. So, 
there's no need to switch tools anymore once you get, and I, I think this is the same for the other products as well. Once you get into these more uh, 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 platform orientations, there's a better opportunity for you to just add more features within the platform as opposed to have to switch to something else. I get asked this a lot. Am I going to outgrow HubSpot? We've never had a client in the 11 years we've been working with HubSpot outgrow it to the point where they had to switch to Salesforce, where they had to switch to Marketo. Um, HubSpot will grow with you. And I think those other products might grow with you too. Uh, generally, like Erica said, we just have a lot more experiences with HubSpot, but I don't think you're going to outgrow it. Yeah, you know, an interesting story uh, about a website project I'm working on now. Um, no platform. I said, you should consider HubSpot. Oh, wow. What's that? Uh, hey, you want to build a new website. That's step one. Go for the HubSpot CMS and that's it. Get the content management system. We'll build the website on it. When you've digested that, now add the marketing hub and we can start to drive people to the website. And then maybe in Q1 of 2023, we'll add the CRM and you can keep track of all your things. And the, the client was like, well, what do you mean? It's just the same software. I said, yeah, you're just going to keep adding modules on as you continue to expand your sales and marketing efforts. And it made such sense that you can use the software in lockstep with the plan that you have to grow your marketing without spending extra or buying something you're not using today. Yeah, it's such a good point and a really good lead into our next question, which is from Pete in Dallas. Currently, we're using Salesforce, HubSpot, and Zendesk for our front office tech stack. Can you talk about the advantages or disadvantages of having everything on a single platform? So it's a little bit of a different question because he's using three really good products, right? There's really, if one of our prospects said, this is my tech stack, I think Eric would agree, like blessings up and down because those are like three leaders in, in their areas for sure. And we see a lot of clients that have that configuration. Um, yes. The advantages uh, are, um, you're, you're getting best of breed across those three tools. And I think the advantages are if, if your organization is embracing them and using them efficiently, then I wouldn't, would never suggest someone switch just for the sake of switching. So, uh, and, and you can connect them re relatively easily. HubSpot has some integrations for Salesforce and Zendesk that make it relatively easy to connect those tools and have data Move, move across all three of those tools so that you get a single perspective on what's going on in the company. Uh, you would be looking at different reporting requirements. So from a service perspective, you're going to be in Zendesk. From a marketing perspective, you're going to be in HubSpot. And from a sales perspective, you're going to be in Salesforce. That might require you to use some uh, data visualization tools like Databox or Power BI or Tableau to pull data together. Uh, one of the big advantages of using, and this gets to the disadvantages of your, Pete, your particular situation is, it is nice when you can look at data from all the sources together. And we've talked about this on past episodes. It, it's critical that you're, you're able to look at data in a way that the data shows insights. And it might be a little challenging to go from Salesforce for sales data to HubSpot to marketing data and Zendesk for service data and be able to uncover those insights, which means you may need one of those uh, data visualization tools to allow you to put stuff together so you can see it in a, from a different perspective. I think that's an extra step that if you're gonna stick with this, you ought, to, you ought to really be considering. The advantages of a single platform, whether you go with Salesforce's you know, complete suite or HubSpot's complete suite, and I think Zendesk now has a complete suite as well, you're not going to have to worry about the data visualization plugin. You're not going to have to worry about integration. You're not going to have to worry about the data moving between the different platforms. You know, everything is there. And to Eric, Eric's point, like you're really, sometimes it's, you don't really notice when you're in the HubSpot sales hub or the HubSpot marketing hub, it really looks the same. It's like a, it's like a tab at the top. There's really no difference. So there are some efficiencies associated with that. But honestly, Pete, it, to me, it really comes down to if you're having pain, associated with these three products, I might consider something different. But if, if they're working well and your organization is, is efficient in, in, in using those three products and you're getting the data you need from them, I would never, in it, by, by any stretch of the imagination, suggest you need to switch. Yeah, I think your point about having pain is poignant, right? If you're not having any pain, then work on other things. But if you're like bogged down because of your technology, it might be time to take a hard look. 
Agreed. All right. So I got a question here from Jessica and Austin. Um, how do we know if our tech stack is a mess? I have my suspicions, but are there signals or clues that we want to consider working to clean it up? So we did talk about a couple of clues uh, around that. And I think that's a really good question that we can spend a little bit more time on because um, there are a bunch of other clues that it might be worth just uh, highlighting for the crew here. Um, so and the reason I want to spend a little more time on this is I think there are a lot of people who aren't sure whether their tech stack is a mess or not. So I think it makes sense to talk about it a little bit. So, you know, we talked about no one owns it. We talked about changes in marketing. We talked about um, changes in sales. Another one is if the rep ranks have grown quickly. So if you had five reps last year, now you have 50 reps. I think there could be that that could potentially be a signal <clears throat> that it's at least worth looking into because honestly, as, as well as you may have trained those reps and as well as you, as you, as well as you may have onboarded them, I think there's a lot of opportunity for those 45 new reps to be doing things differently, to be putting data in differently, to be using the system differently, to maybe have made changes to the system to support like the way they used to do things versus the way you want to do things. And anytime you have large growth in either sales or marketing or customer service, I think that's potentially an opportunity to at least take a look at what's going on and make sure that things are still running the way you expected them to be. Um, Eric, you have a lot of sales experience. You want to talk a little bit more about either sales leadership changes or, or uh, massive growth in the rep ranks? Well, any kind of growth, I should say any kind of transition or change stresses out your technology, right? Now we have to add more people. Maybe we need more seats, depending on what the software is. So number one, when you go through one of those changes, it's a natural breaking point to take a look at what's going on. Oh, we just added three reps. We had three reps. We've now doubled the size of our department. Let's make sure we do that. Uh, or take a look at that. And the reason being is that no matter what, you're going to find things that are going to be out of order. You're going to have newer processes that came online since the last time you updated that. And I think that to answer the bigger question is companies like ours that help companies with technology are typically more than willing to take a look under the hood and see what's going on and give you some feedback. So if you, let's say, are not connected to an agency or a consulting firm and you are bringing on three reps and you have three reps and you're a little concerned, say, hey, well, can you just audit what I have going on and give me the shopping list of things that you think I should be doing? At the end of the day, they might uncover things that you might not have realized. They might uncover things that are mission critical or, and that are holding you back. And if anything, you'll have a nice setup of the new people in the same format as everybody now because you, you, you basically have a fresh start. At Square Two, we've been offering the 13-point HubSpot checkup forever. And the only reason we do that is because nobody wants to pay for an audit, but it's a good way for us to get in there and say, hey, actually, everything's pretty fine. Maybe a couple hundred bucks to sew these things up, or you got a bowl of spaghetti working there, my friend. It's going to take a couple thousands of dollars to fix this. And that's where you at least get a, a baseline of where you are today. It doesn't mean you have to spend any money, but at least you know where you are. So I take advantage of things like free audits and having someone take a look at it, uh, logging in as a guest and just snooping around. Someone who really has a set of eyes that sees what's working and what's not. I mean, if you're any kind of B2B sales organization and you have ticket averages of, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 and up to be realistic, one extra deal because of your technology being um, uh, souped up will pay for any consultant a couple of times over. So it's important with your technology not to be penny wise and dollar foolish. Get someone in there that knows exactly what they're looking for. Get a list of all the things that has to be enhanced, fixed, tweak, whatever it is. Pick away at that list in some reasonable order that fits your budget and then make it so that the technology doesn't slow you down, but helps you accelerate. Yeah, it's a really good point. Also, like sales teams tend to have a pretty high turnover rate. Like, Oh, we hired this guy. He's not working out. We let him go. Like those, uh, that turnover also can, can be a signal that you might want to keep an eye on what's going on in your CRM, you know, like even notifications, right? So a new, someone fills out a form, they want to talk to somebody. If that rep left and you didn't change the notification, 
you know, you're going to have a lead that's uncovered, right? And that's just a, that's just a shame. Someone's asking to talk, and we see this all the time. Someone's asking to talk to you, and you're not forwarding that inquiry to somebody who's still here to follow up on it. Now the company thinks like, oh, they didn't get back to me. Like they're not interested in my business. It's obviously not the experience we're looking for. So uh, anytime there's a lot of reps being added or when there's a lot of rep turnover, I think that's a signal that you might want to have uh, take a hard look at how the CRM is functioning and how the, the uh, marketing automation is functioning as well. I'll give you one more signal. Let's and then you have a company. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, let's say you have a company and you depend on your delivery vehicles. You got a hundred delivery vehicles, right? It's not like you're not going to change the oil or make sure the tires are safe or you know, make sure that the inspection is in order. You got to take care of those tools because they drive your business. It's the same thing with technology. Using marketing automation platforms, CRM, content management, they're the tools that are driving your business. You got to bring them into the shop now and then. Yeah, really good point. Um, so my last uh, signal, uh, and then we'll do some more questions is if you've been creating a ton of new content, that's another signal that you might want to take a look at what's up uh, with your marketing automation platform. And just to give you an example, every piece of new content, it needs a new CTA, it needs a new landing page, it needs a form, it needs a new confirmation page, it needs a new delivery page, it needs new lead nurturing emails. All that content, that all of those tools that wrap around that new piece of content are gonna get built in your, in your marketing platform. So you know, if your CTAs are not named properly, if they don't look similar, if your landing pages are not named properly, if they don't look similar, if you're not taking a look at which landing pages are working and which pages aren't, and maybe making some adjustments in real time to that, if you're using the wrong form, if your confirmation page isn't uh, configured properly, if it's triggering the wrong lead nurturing emails or your lead nurturing emails aren't working, all those things have to be checked and, and organized properly because this can very quickly get out of hand. You know, if you're creating a new piece of content every month and someone different is doing it every month, I can guarantee you, you're going to have 12 different CTAs that don't look alike, 12 different names for your landing pages. Some of them might even be classified as website pages. So it, it's really quickly going to make things much messier than they need to be. So Again, if you're creating a lot of content, might be a signal that you want to take a closer look at um, what's going on with your portal. Okay. Great point. So this is from Kathy in Houston, Eric. I'm pretty sure ours is a mess and I want to tackle the cleanup. Where should I start? You got any advice for her? Audit. Get the audit going, right? Let's see what's going on. I mean, it's the same thing when you go to Jiffy Lube. And they check it out. And then the guy comes out into the waiting room and he's like, okay, we also checked your air filter and that's below grade. Or I did the measurement on your tires. You still have a, a few uh, 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 miles left, but you won't pass inspection next time. Great, put it on the list. I'll choose not to do this now. I'll choose it to, uh, to move forward with this uh, before. You gotta have an audit, right? And the audit is only because uh, Kathy in Houston has not attended to her marketing technology uh, on a regular basis because the audit is not necessary if you have someone going in there on a quarterly basis and, and checking it out. So a regular maintenance schedule, and I hate to keep using the car, but every 3,000 miles, got to change your oil. Every quarter, you got to check your marketing automation tool. So I would start with an audit. I keep a running list of things that have to be done. I prioritize those. And then I would contract with the person who um, can help you for things that you don't have bandwidth or expertise and any tweaks that you can make internally, just do them in your free time. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good uh, set of directions. And Kathy, if you, if you want to try to tackle this on your own, there are a lot of articles uh, that would help you kind of walk through the different areas of your portal and, and let you do that audit on your own. Uh, if you Google uh, messy HubSpot portal, you'll find a couple of HubSpot related articles to talk about best practices around auditing it. And, you know, yes, you'd have to do the work. It would be your perspective versus a, someone else's perspective. But, you know, that's probably a good place to start. I would also start with uh, the sales part of it first, because that's where the reps are spending all their time. So, uh, you know, making sure that the records are clean and making sure that all the automation is working correctly and making sure any email tools that are in there are being used by the reps properly. 
And then I would move on to um, uh, the notifications because that is really mission critical. And I, I would, again, this isn't like, I don't envy you having to do this, but if you have to do this on your own, I would go through all the forms, fill them out and make sure the right people are getting notified. And I would also go in and put, you know, someone uh, um, a little more central to the organization on the notifications also. Could be a sales manager, could be a sales leader, could be you, could be someone else in marketing so that somebody else is on that notification so that if a rep does leave or if there are changes in sales, uh, somebody can say, hey, did you guys follow up on this lead? I got a notification yesterday and you know, I didn't see anything in the CRM at all. No, no, John left. No, no, no about it. OK, here, here it is. Have somebody follow up on it and then go in and change the notification. So uh, there are definitely some things you can do your own to tackle that cleanup. Um, and I would start with those mission critical things like the rep records, the rep automation, and any kind of notifications in the marketing automation platform. And then from there, you can get into naming conventions. And, and we're going to talk a minute about data, you know, what's up with the data and the lists and all those other things that are important, but maybe not as important as those other items we talked about. Cool. All right. So Carl in New York City, honestly, how important is this? What impact does a messy tech stack actually have on our business? I think this is a good question because honestly, Eric, like how big an impact is this really going to be uh, on what we're trying to accomplish? I mean, OK, I have to spend a little extra time in there because things aren't named properly. But like is that, is, you know, is that really going to impact how we're doing from a performance perspective? Well, I'll go back to my car analogy. Let's say you chose not to fix your bowl of spaghetti in your tech stack, right? The same way you, you know, I'm just not gonna change my oil. No problem, things will keep running. But then one day, one day in the future, the car explodes, right? So now let's look at that scenario. Now your bowl of spaghetti gets worse and worse and worse and worse in your portal until one day nothing is working or you get a new employee and they get in there and all of a sudden everything's broken, right? Think about the pain that would be involved with your business, basically the sales and marketing um, uh, functions coming to a standstill while you had a massive um, uh, emergency surgery on your portal. Like who wants that? So, you know, is it necessary? I would think it is in the same way that proper maintenance for all things is necessary to keep everything optimized, to keep things running smoothly, to keep things uh, 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 like you said, I love your idea, Mike, about the notifications being a leading indicator. If I'm not getting notifications, what's the point? So yeah, I actually think it is, uh, Carl from New York City, one of the top priorities you should have in marketing is to keep an eye out for regular maintenance of your portal. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Also, this is a very timely analogy, but with gas prices so high, if your car is not running correctly, you're not going to be getting the gas mileage you expect. If your tires are a little low, if your engine isn't, you know, running correctly, you know, you're going to be spending a lot more money on gas than you probably should be. And I think that's the appropriate analogy here. I don't think HubSpot is going to uh, grind to a halt where we can't click on anything and it's not going to work. But it is very possible that what should take you five minutes takes you an hour. I think that's very possible. And I think that is is definitely a problem and one that would need to be addressed, especially when you're a small group of people working on marketing and trying to support sales. You don't have 100 hours a week. You have 40 hours a week. And if everything is taking you 10 times as long as it should, you're not going to get to those really important things. You're going to be spending all your time hunting and pecking through HubSpot or through Salesforce or through um, Adobe to find what you're looking for when it should be organized in a, and working in a much more efficient way. In essence, you're not getting the efficiencies that the marketing automation product uh, 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 promised you when you bought it. So I do think it's a big priority. Yes, you could stumble through. Yes, you could model through for a period of time, but eventually it's probably going to catch up with you and you're going to need to fix it. Awesome. Let's see. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Let me like scan through these questions. This is a good one for you, Eric. If we're considering getting help with a cleanup project like this, can you give me a rough estimate on what we should expect to invest in this project? This is from Tom in Los Angeles. So we've done some projects like this. So what do you what, what would you say to someone who who is looking to maybe budget some money to, to do a cleanup? Yeah, I'll give you a recent prospect example. Um, because their company was hurt quite substantially by COVID, 
they decided to pull back on their sales and marketing in April or May of 2020 and literally didn't touch it until today, which is March of 2022. So the estimate for that was $10,000 a month for three months to fix everything up and then an ongoing um, connection for $3,000 a month to keep it organized going forward. I think that's an extreme case of someone who just didn't touch their um, HubSpot or Salesforce for two complete years plus. I would think more frequently, we're seeing things like $2,000 to $3,000 a month to keep regular maintenance, just like your oil changes every quarter. But then intermittent projects, when things come up, 800 bucks here, 900 bucks there, $2,000 here. So I think that we're not talking about huge numbers, especially if your company has either a high ticket average on their sales or a long lifetime value of the customers they're maintaining. But I'd be prepared if you haven't touched your portal in a while for 10,000 or less. And if you want more maintenance, think about it in the framework of about one to $2,000 a month to just have an agency like ours, keep going in there, keep cleaning it out, keep updating, keep tweaking. Good, excellent. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit. We're new to HubSpot. So it's so new, it's not a mess. This is Lisa in Portland. But what's one tip you could share with us to prevent it from becoming a mess in the future? And I got, I got you, Lisa. Here's something you want to think about. Before you start really doing too much, start creating some documentation. And you really should do this with any software. You know, this is our naming convention. This is how we want to name things in HubSpot. This is how we're going to do things in HubSpot. This is how we're going to do email campaigns. This is how we're going to do landing pages. This is how we're going to do website pages. This is how we're going to store uh, files like images and videos. This is where we're going to store them. Uh, these are the dashboards we're running, and here's who's accessing these dashboards. So I really think this is a documentation exercise. It's a best practices exercise, and it's going to allow your company to talk through these standard operating procedures, get everybody to agree, document it as you do it. So it's not as if you have to cover every single aspect of HubSpot out of the gate, but as you get it configured and as you get it set up, do, the, do a little bit of documentation along the way. Most HubSpot configuration and onboarding takes about three months and it's very objective oriented. So you know, if your objective is to get email campaigns out, then the onboarding is going to start around, you know, building email campaigns and managing email campaigns and your documentation around best practices can follow. Who needs to get notified when a lead converts? Is it the rep? Is it the sales manager? Is it the VP of sales? Do you want to be notified? Is, does, your, does your boss want to get notified? Set all that documentation up and make sure that everyone knows where it is and everyone knows how to access it. I believe in HubSpot, you can even have links to access that documentation. So while you're using the tool, you can have links trigger that allow you to, to take a look at that particular piece of your documentation and make sure everyone knows exactly what they want to do. So without a lot of effort going into it with this in mind, you can set yourself up for success. Now, the only like a uh, warning flag here or cautionary tale, I should say is whatever you set up at the outset is probably going to change. So somebody has to own this documentation so that when you're in a meeting and someone says, okay, from now on notifications have to go to eight, you, you have to know that, okay, that means I need to go in and not only change the notifications in HubSpot, but change the notification documentation as well. You know, we don't want to manage our emails like this anymore. We want to manage them like that. Hey, all of our landing pages need to have form A on it instead of form B. Like, okay, fix it in HubSpot, fine, but then change the documentation as well because that's really what people are going to lean on. And if you leave or you get promoted and someone else has to step into your seat, they'll have everything they need to keep your, your, your instance working perfectly, clean, and running in an optimized way. I would say also go back and watch the movie Apollo 13 when the lunar landing module dies and they have to switch it over, they take the playbook, step one, step two, step three, they documented that just in case of that so they can go back. The other part about Apollo 13, which I always find fascinating is when the CO2 levels were high and they had to like rig that whole system to save themselves. And they, before they even relayed it up to the astronauts, they wrote it down. One, rip the cover off the book. Two, get one white sock. Three, two pieces of duct tape, right? And I always thought that was so interesting how those engineers thought about those processes 
And the same thing is with your HubSpot or Salesforce, right? If you have that documentation, you don't have to go far in before you find a problem. Agreed. An engineering mindset around these tools is going to be very helpful for sure. Um, and again, with all of the people that are potentially accessing this and all of the turnover that organizations have and all the changes you're going to make, I mean, I guarantee whatever you implement out of the gate is not going to be what you're running in a couple of months. So having that documentation as a backbone is going to be very helpful. And Eric's right. Try to be as detailed oriented as possible. Again, if you're documenting it while you're doing it, it's relatively easy to create a playbook. Oh, I just did that. Let me write it down. I just did that. Let me write it down. I just did that. Let me write it down. If you have to go back and recreate those steps, it does become a much bigger issue for sure. And if you're in trouble, you call Tom Hanks, he'll get you out of trouble. Right. I know your other favorite movie along the same lines, The Martian, right? Doesn't he, doesn't he uh, go through a lot of uh, that kind of stuff to, to keep him alive on the red planet? Yes, without being too coarse, we're going to science the shit out of this. Right, <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Okay, so let's see. Ken in Seattle asked us one more question, and we talked about it a little bit. Does HubSpot offer any tools that might help us keep our portal organized and clean? Any best practices? So, unfortunately, no tools. But like I said, the HubSpot knowledge base is expansive. So you, they have so many articles and so many resources a lot of them created by users, a lot of them created by people at HubSpot. So you can very easily uh, access that knowledge base inside HubSpot. You can very easily access that knowledge base by Googling it. So Ken, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, but there's a plethora of resources that you can get your hands on. And I imagine that with a little bit of clicking and a little bit of perusing, eventually you'll find a couple of documents that I think are gonna help you. I mean, it would be nice if you could click a button and like, you know, <laughs> clean up all your notifications or clean up all your naming conventions to, to have them look like that. Maybe that's a future uh, uh, feature to submit to the HubSpot product team. Um, but in the meantime, I think if you go and access the knowledge base, you'll find plenty of information that will at least help you get started. And with that, uh, that handles all our questions. Eric, anything you want to add before we wrap up? I mean, be proactive. Don't be reactive when it comes to your tech stack. It'll only serve you going forward. Yeah. So for those of you that listened for 55 minutes, congratulations. Here's our Easter egg. Eric mentioned it briefly in the middle of our call. We are willing to do free 13-point HubSpot checkups. So no obligation, no charge. If you email Eric at eric at squared to marketing.com, he will get our team activated to go into HubSpot specifically and look at 13 areas of your HubSpot uh, instance that we've identified where people generally run into issues. Everything from security to user access to um, whether the chat tool is working right, the, the state of your, uh, uh, we'll look at notifications, we'll look at your templates. Like there's a long list of items that we'll look at in the checkup. If you want one done on your HubSpot, just email Eric at eric at squared to marketing.com. No obligation. We will not try to sell you anything. When we're done, we will simply show you what needs assistance and we'll actually give you a really nice report that shows you exactly what we recommend for each of those areas that have problems. We'll score them, we'll grade them green, yellow, red, and you can you know take the report and off you go or talk to us about how we might be able to help you with that. Free prize inside, no obligation, just email Eric. And... If you enjoyed the show, check us out on YouTube at the Square Two Marketing Channel. Like us, subscribe, listen to us on all your favorite podcast platforms. Subscribe, like us, leave us comments. Check out the show on Square Two Plus at our website, squaretomarketing.com backslash square two plus P L U S. Uh, and if you want to submit a question like the questions you got to hear today, go to What's Wrong with Revenue, also on the Square Two Plus, uh, also on the Square Two website. Go to the bottom, there's a link. And you can submit questions. You can also subscribe to the show there and we'll send you recordings of the show as soon as we're finished. Come back and join us next Wednesday at four o'clock when we answer the question, what's wrong with revenue? Next Wednesday, it's going to be, you don't have the right mix of marketing tactics. Eric, thanks a lot for doing the show with me today. Good luck in Detroit. I'll see you back in Philly on Friday. And everybody, thanks. Have a really great day. Talk to y'all soon.